Yes, everybody, welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com, or of course, if you are watching on our rapidly growing YouTube channel on the race for 10,000 subscribers right now before the end of basketball season. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me from Brooklyn, New York, at the Barclays Center, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ just saw the Tar Heels lose in the ACC tournament semifinals, 72-59 to to 7th seed Virginia Tech. Uh, Carolina dropping to 24-9 on the year. VT improving to 22 and 12 and obviously face Duke in the championship game tomorrow evening. Before we dive into this one, though, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor on this podcast, The Rogue Shop. Check them out at therogueshop.com. We've been blasting their products for a few months now. Really, really high quality stuff. Top shelf family grown hemp products, CBD, Delta 8, Delta 9, tinctures, oils, gummies, whatever you're looking for. They've got you covered. Me and AJ have tried them. We have other couple staff members that swear by them as well. Really, really high quality products. So head on over to theroadshop.com. Link in the description below. Make sure you use that promo code TARHEELS10 to save on your order as well. Again, that's theroadshop.com. You can find a link to that in the description. But AJ, first thing I want to talk about in this one, got to start with shooting. We got to start with the guards in particular. For Carolina, bad shooting night for Carolina all around, really. UNC shot just 37% on the night, 12% from three-point land. This is a team that relies heavily on their jump shooting, relies heavily on their outside shooting. And when you shoot like that, you you, you can be prone. Or The perfect storm, I think, is what I called it with some other factors that went into this one for Carolina to lose lopsidedly. But A.J. guards, R.J. Davis and, and Caleb Love in particular combined just five of 27 from the floor. I know Caleb really, really struggled with his shot as well in particular. So just a tough night for Carolina all the way around when it came to shooting the ball besides Armando Bacato hit on him a little bit later. But, you know, when you look at your guards, guys, you really rely on heavily to get you points, get your buckets shooting like that against the Virginia tech team that's playing really well right now. It's a recipe for disaster. If you're Carolina. Yeah. Armando was nine for 10. The rest of the team was 13 for 50. But in RJ, I think there were five for 27 combined. And they were off early. They were Hubert said he thought they got a lot of good looks in the first half. They just didn't make them. And they were more challenged in the second half. You know, Virginia Tech was switching like crazy on the screens. And they were switching well. They were sometimes, you know, when teams switch, I, we talked about this before during the season that sometimes it kind of lends itself maybe to a little bit of laziness because, oh, that guy's got him. So that sort of mindset. Uh, that wasn't the case with the Hokies. They, they just really got in Carolina's grill. Uh, did not allow a whole lot of open stuff in the second half. And then when Carolina tried to drive against that stuff was contested as well. It's a bad offensive night for the Tar Heels. Only 11 turnovers, but seemed like more. I think part of it was because we've seen so much chemistry between Armando and Brady during the course of the year, and certainly over the last five or six weeks. And I think Armando and Brady combined at least for three turnovers trying to dish to each other. One a little bit later probably at about the eight-minute mark of the first half. And he was visibly frustrated after the second turnover where, where it wasn't like I made a bad play so much. It's like, man, they really defended that well. Like, there's nothing there. They had a – Harmado had four, point, four shots in the first half. They had a hard time giving the ball. The Hokies were doubling him. But they said that the double was coming from the, – the double, the second defender was coming from the baseline, which is different than – It's unique how uh, he, they were being doubled here. Kind of threw the heels off. I mean, they the threes were covered and the driving lanes weren't really there. And when that, you know when Caleb starts getting frustrated, you could see his face and he was chirping some a little bit. Then it, it does affect the rest of his game. We've talked a lot about how Caleb's in his process. Part of the process are the really good moments. Part of the process are nights like tonight where he must figure out ways to maybe take a few uh, less shots it, when he's highly contested. He gets the ball at 11 seconds left on the shot clock and pounds it into the to the, to the the hardwood, and, and he's the only guy. You know he's going to take the shot. Everybody in the building knew he was going to take the shot. It happens sometimes when he gets really frustrated because he thinks that he could create something against anybody. That wasn't the case at all. It was not a pretty performance by the Tar Heels. Uh, they, they, even some of the baskets they made, you know, they had some follows, they had some putbacks. Uh, they were able to get our monitor to roll a little bit after some screens and get a few dunks, but how many baskets can you recall that Armando got, even though he was the guy that went 9 for 10, where they dumped it down to him on the block, 
he turned and scored over his guy. Mm-hmm. I think maybe one, and he used a pump fake and got a layup, and the double guy was right there. In fact, the foul could have been called, but it wasn't. So there was nothing smooth about what the heels did tonight. It was a poor offensive uh, performance, and I think that they were rattled kind of early because they, they didn't – you know, they, they, they like to have that little skip going. And when they have that skip going, a lot of stuff happens. They didn't have it early. And Hubert later on said that he thought the team was tired. I think tired shows when frustration shows up. Mm-hmm. And we saw that tonight. And uh, really, I saw it in the first half. Uh, if you go on the board, I was commenting on the board in the first half. You could see some of those things happening. And that 9 nothing run to start the second half kind yeah. of set it in for good. Yeah, definitely. AJ, I thought it wasn't a, a great night for Carolina offensively at all. And perfect segue into talking about the defense. This is what I want to hit on really quickly as well. Before we do that, Brady Manick, uh, Caleb Love, RJ Davis had 10 points a piece tonight, only shot a combined nine for 37 on the night though. So not a great shooting performance from either any of those guys. Armando Baycott, like you mentioned, 19 points, 14 boards, uh, nine for 10 from the floor. So another double, double for him, really efficient night shooting the ball off from Armando. Obviously a lot of that close up though, but AJ, let's talk about Carolina's defensive issues. Uh, Virginia Tech shot 44%, 45% from three. Hubert Davis hit on this team being a little bit tired in this game. I think it was pretty evident. This looked like a pretty fatigued Carolina team physically. And I think it obviously showed up on the defensive side as well, especially in that second half. There was points in that g- game where Virginia Tech was hitting threes. They were going down low, getting what they wanted um, through some of their bigs. And, and overall, like I said, it wasn't a great offensive night for Carolina. But on the flip side, I didn't think it was a much better defensive performance from the Heels either. Yeah, when you're not playing well offensively, you have to get stops. If you want to avoid allowing runs, you have to get stops. And the uh, Hokies scored a three late in the first half when Carolina got caught in a terrible switch. Uh, Kerwin Walton and Armando Baycott. Kerwin didn't handle that properly and, and left Kevin Aluma wide open for three right in front of me. And he hit that, and they went up six and a half. And then the Hokies come out, boom, hit him with a 9 nothing run to open the second half. It was 12 nothing, spanning both halves. And I kind of – Got the impression that Carolina really never recovered. They had that run later on. They had a little nine nothing spurt, cut it to eleven. But mm. like they, they did have a lot have a lot of reserve in the tank, and they used some to do. And then they promptly allowed, uh, I guess, it was a four point play by Maddox. And before that, I believe it was a three. So they 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 really had some issues. And if, in the first half, I thought they were okay defensively. It was interesting that Leakey started out on Couture, and then Leakey mm. picked up foul trouble, and, and you know Hubert rode with Puff in the last 12 and a half minutes of the first half. I thought he did okay, but I was surprised when he went to Kerwin, hadn't played Kerwin in the first half in a while, and he went to him, and Kerwin had some issues defensively. It's been one of Kerwin's primary weaknesses since he arrived at Carolina, and then he put him back in the second half, Padilla, Padilla which just went right at him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did the first half, did the second half, and then uh, there were some cross-ups on some of those possessions. I also think the Hokies going to four guards really affected Carolina a lot too because you had Brady chasing. Uh, you had, you know, you, it's like the Hokies had a pretty good sink going. Yeah. They were able to move the ball around. It's like Carolina was in chase mode. Mm-hmm. I, I thought Carolina was in chase mode in the first half. They just didn't look like themselves. They, they kind of – I don't want to say it wouldn't be fair to say they reverted back to what we saw earlier, but we saw some some of the traits of what happened earlier. Yeah, in some reminiscent games. for sure. Mm-hmm. But but I think a lot of that is is the Hokies. I think the Hokies did a lot of good stuff, and it was just the Tar Heels losing to a pretty good team that played very well tonight, and and they did things to kind of keep the Tar Heels out of the good character. There are two characters with this Carolina team. There's the bad and there's the good. Lately, we've seen a lot of the good, even when they haven't been really solid throughout a 40 minute game, all that lunch pail stuff, and those intangibles we've talked about how they've accumulated helped them get through. But what's going to happen tonight because the Hokies were hitting from the perimeter. They get production from the bench last night when you and I uh, did a quick uh, podcast, pre uh, looking ahead to this game. I said, you know, the di- biggest difference between Virginia tech now and when Carolina played them the first two times, the Hokies are getting production from the bench. Yeah. Maddox and Padula are really good players, and they're going to play. A, they're going to be really good for them down the road. And when you have two guys that can come in that can score like that, and they can defend pretty well, but it looks like he's 15 years old out there. But he, he's got a little boxy in his game. Yeah, he does. And he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've seen that the last three days here, and I, I just think they had they had more of that. They they were confident. Carolina had a little 
they had some chatting going with each other. And you know, it was at one point when Caleb was trying to lift up uh, Kerwin because Kerwin had that difficult stretch. And the, the Carolina was bickering at the refs a lot tonight, especially in the second mm-hmm. half. Uh, Brady was complaining a lot. And Leaky kind of had a thing going there with uh, Teddy, Teddy Valentine for a while when there was a play right down here on the baseline in front of me where they ruled the ball off Carolina hand when it looked, looked clearly like it was off the attack. And the Hokies kept the ball and they scored. That was actually, um, it should have been, yeah. It, yeah, they didn't quite clearly didn't get the right call on that. <clears throat> and Leakey said something to Teddy. There was a dead ball like a minute and a half later. Leakey went back and started talking to him about it. <laughs> and then about six minutes later, there was a foul call and stuff like that. So I'm not criticizing any of the Carolina kids. I'm just saying I'm painting the picture of kind of what, what their disposition, what, what, what I observed, what they gave off tonight. They just didn't have all their dots connected from the get-go. They mm. were missing shots early. They didn't defend that great. And then in the second half, they, they really struggled. In fact, I think probably the part of the second half that really illustrated their struggles defensively was when they – Carolina made a nine, had a nine-nothing run, to, nothing run to cut it to 11. And then, boom, the Hokies, I think, in the three, and then they had the four-point play for Maddox. That was kind of that mm. whatever – uh, flame that Carolina was trying to flicker right there. The Hokies just dumped a bunch of sand on it and it was out. And the game was just a matter of the clock moving to, to get to the final sound horn. So, yeah. um, not a great performance, but I don't think this is uh, the kind of thing the Tar Heels are going to are going to carry with them and sulk over and and it's going to affect their confidence. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. And they just didn't play well tonight. And they play a team that did play very well and a team that's better than they were when they played them last time. Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, Carolina's beat Virginia Tech twice this year. When you look at how well Virginia Tech has been playing, it's tough to beat a team like that three times in a season. I say that a lot in sports because it really is when you get to a high level like this, especially, like I said, when the Virginia Tech team's playing really well. Last thing I want to hit on really quickly, you kind of already talked about it a little bit, but it kind of just felt overall like Carolina really never found its groove. Um, I, I tweeted it kind of midway through the first half, maybe towards the end of the first half. It looked like a Virginia Tech team that was playing with a bit of swagger and it looked kind of the opposite of, of Carolina. I didn't know like Carolina had that moxie, had that, that swagger, had that almost confidence, which is a little bit surprising when you look how well Carolina has played over recent weeks. I mean, winning 12 of the last 14 games, including six straight. So this is a confident Carolina team, but we've seen performances like this. I'm not going to say this is, this is, you know, exactly what we've seen earlier in the year in some of the blowouts. I thought it was a little bit better than that in some respects, but, there were, like you said, there were certain aspects of those blowouts and those big time losses we saw earlier in the year that crept back up to the surface today, even though I don't think it was as dooming gloom for the most part as some of those were. Unless you're like the 05, 08, 09, 12, <clears throat> 16, 17 Tar Heels, even the 19 Tar Heels, mm-hmm. confidence can be fleeting. Yeah. This club hasn't ascended to the level of those teams, so confidence is fleeting. And when you, when your two guards are not shooting the ball well, and Caleb's getting frustrated, they all know when he's getting frustrated because that clearly affects everybody. When, when the ball is being pounded on the floor, there was uh, one possession in the second half, about maybe six minutes in. I counted the dribbles. Caleb dribbled seventeen times and, and before getting rid of the ball. I mean, part of it's not it's not that it's Caleb's fault for dribbling. Caleb's like, I'm just going to dribble, dribble until I find something. Nothing was there. Mm. So like they, they didn't move well without the ball. They didn't screen well. I know was, David Sisk has pro, pro, proclaimed him the best screener in the ACC. <laughs> it wasn't a great screening night. No. It wasn't a great night coming off screens. It wasn't a great night getting around screens or switching, whatever it was they were doing at various different times. It wasn't a great boxing out night. They missed some box outs today. It wasn't a great playing through contact around the rim and scoring and getting a plus one night. They didn't get to the line a ton. They had been getting the they got the line a lot the first few times against the Hokies. They, they just didn't do the things that they had been doing all that well today. Mm. So finding the groove, they never found a groove. I mean, there was never a sequence in the game where I thought, hey, this is a club we've seen the last few games. I never never saw it. So you're thinking, okay, they're gonna have to wood chip their way to a victory here. It's kind of hard to do that when another the other team has to do their shoot threes. And they're getting open threes, and a good team that they're playing is playing well. So it just happens in basketball. Sometimes a good team is in another A game, they play another good team, that team is, and they lose. Duke saw it last weekend in Durham. Carolina was on its game. Carolina saw it tonight when the Hokies were on. 
their game. So that's pretty much the way I look at it. I don't, I don't think this is the kind of game where I've, I, I checked out social media a little bit before when I was waiting for Hubert and Armando to come into the press conference. In the anti-Hubert brigade, it's like all over the place. I told you so. The same people whose mouths were shut the last three weeks. Let the stuff play out. Mm-hmm. Let the man learn how to do his job. All the stuff is intel. It's all a lesson for all these kids. I I kind of joke with Brett Friedlander uh, after the presser. I said, you know, I don't think this team's ever going to hit its potential because I don't don't think the season's going to be long enough for them to. Yeah, they are they are ascend they are ascending. They're still getting better, and I think tonight is a part of that process of getting better. But the problem is they don't have 30 more games. Yeah. If, if the season ended in mid-May or early May, and they played you know, 20, 30 more games, I think we might see this team eventually reach its potential. Problem is, the season's going to run out and forth. Mm-hmm. They're going to make the NCAA tournament. They're going to lose next week, the week after, whatever it is. This team's not going to win a national championship. It's pretty hard to see something like that happening. Yeah. So they're going to lose here in the next couple of weeks. That'll be the end of the season. And I think even if they play poorly that night, they'll still be ascending. Because yeah. I think they'll, I think they all feel for each other a lot better, a lot differently now than they did earlier in the year. I think a big part of that's humor. Mm. I, I, you know, there were a couple of things that I can say. Okay, well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But I don't think any of those decisions that he made, if they were different, would have really impacted the game. I think they were going to lose tonight. It was, yeah. they appeared that way early on. They just didn't have the groove. They weren't going to find their groove. But the door was swung open a couple of times a little bit by the Hokies, and Carolina just didn't get through. Yeah. So, one of those nights. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. AJ, good place to wrap this one up. Carolina falling out of the ACC tournament, 72 to 59 in the semifinal to seven seed Virginia Tech, like I said earlier, and uh, falling to 24 and nine on the year. Obviously, selection Sunday coming on up on Sunday. We're going to do a quick little podcast here after this one as well, kind of looking ahead a little bit to that one and just talking about it and what our kind of expectations for where Carolina might go. So if you want to go, Watch that one. That one will be out. Uh, should be out on Saturday at some point. Uh, probably Saturday. Saturday probably Saturday night. night. Saturday well, night. Saturday night. After, yeah. after I get back from here, I'll pop yeah. it up. Got a long drive down there from New York. So yeah, and I, and I did well. drive. I, did, I, I knew I drove because everyone else that flew, they have to wait till Sunday to fly home. Oh, yeah. I'm that's a good move. Then. I'd rather just that's hop what, in the car and go. That's a pro move by AJ. Right? Yeah, that is a pro move right there. AJ, good stuff on that. Thinking outside See, the when, box. When you, say, when you say that's a pro move to me, I consider that a high compliment. <laughs> hey, it is, man. Even, though I, it, even though I fed it to you this time. It's a compliment, man. Anytime I say pro move, it's a compliment. That definitely is one. Absolutely. So you travels on your way back down. You got a late night already, almost 1 a.m. over here on our time. So you, you haven't. I won't be done right until 4 <laughs> 30. Yeah. I was the last one to leave Barclays last night. I left at 3 40 in the morning. <laughs> I think I'll be going past four tonight. Hey, any positive takeaway from this Carolina fans? No more 930 tips. You don't have to stay up too late. I think tomorrow was set to be 830 of Carolina one. So that was going to be a late nighter as well. So that I get to any positive to take away from the loss. That's one thing to keep in mind. But again, Carolina loses 72 to 59. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Make sure you guys keep it locked to TarHillIllustrated.com for all your post game coverage and all your coverage leading up to selection Sunday this weekend. As always, guys, like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. As always, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.